This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for joining us today. We're here to talk today with Lyle Jeremy Rubin, author and anti-war veteran activist. Lyle, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, and I'm happy to be here. Real happy to have you here. Um, so Lyle is a veteran of the war in Afghanistan who writes about capitalism and U.S. empire. He has a doctorate in history from the University of Rochester and has contributed to a variety of publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Nation, Raritan, and N plus one. When he's not working or reading, he likes to pay attention to the birds. Awesome thing to pay, to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, I, I found uh, actually my my wife uh, really taught me to pay attention to the birds, and I, I felt like it was this very healing experience for me. Uh, I spent my entire life not really paying attention to them. And once you do, you find them everywhere and they're fucking beautiful and they're just going about their day. It doesn't matter what we as humans are doing at any given moment. They're just doing their own thing. And I find that to be a beautiful thing. Yeah, I could see, I could see someone finding a lot of peace a lot, uh, in, in that and, and all the study of it. Yeah. So tell us about the book. Pain is weakness leaving the body. What, uh, you know, what, what were you after in terms of, of this text? Was it, you know, what were you trying to, to share with everybody? Um, and uh, anything else you'd like to know just kind of about the, the basics of the book? Sure. So, uh, well, first and foremost, I was trying to tell my truth about my own military experience. Um, I'd kind of like um, held off on writing any kind of book about my military experience for, well, at least about, about a decade. Um, cause I, I felt like it was kind of a dirty thing to do. Um, um, for a lot of reasons. Um, so I, I wrote essays, but most of the essays I've written and most of the op-eds I've written have been kind of explicitly like political pieces and political arguments. But at some point I was like, I need, there was, there were a lot of ideas I was having and a lot of thoughts that I just didn't see being expressed. Um, so I just felt a need to put it all out there, um, both for myself, uh, to be honest, for myself to a large degree, but also for anyone else that can maybe relate to some of it or most of it or all of it. Um, and, you know, to kind of like summarize uh book itself or it's both both a memoir but it's also kind of various political arguments that i think are related to each other um but i think you know if you if you pay attention enough to american foreign poli policy discourse you know it's amazing how obsessed americans are about defense and security uh, they're so concerned all the time about defending themselves and securing themselves. Uh, and at the same time, this kind of obsession with security and defense almost always leads to various forms of aggression. Um, and you see it at more micro levels beyond just foreign policy. Like when it comes to the gun debate, you know, stand your ground laws and just the way the right talks about guns um, and the way they talk about the Second Amendment. It's very much about um, self-defense and defending themselves from all these threats that are all, all, are all around them at, at, you know, all the time. And of course, a lot of these people that are so obsessed with the Second Amendment and self-defense are also, you know, are often a lot of times implicated in various forms of aggression, whether it's you know, domestic violence, um, whether it's um, violence towards neighbors or other people in their community. Um, there seems to be a connection between people that are always obsessed with defending themselves and people that are always hurting others uh, and being aggressive. 
So I, I kind of just intuited through my years in the Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps for five years from um, 2000, June of 2006 um, to uh, May of 2011. And I was in Afghanistan 2010 for, for basically the entire year. Um, throughout this time, I was kind of like gradually coming to this realization that I, I was meeting all these people in my own life. And I was also thinking about my own, my own person and, you know, my own reasons for why I joined and why I felt the need to put on a uniform and pick up a weapon and fight these phantoms from abroad. And, you know, I mean, I have the more noble reasons for doing so, which I, I'm not going to totally dismiss. Like, I think that I really did believe in the mission at the time I was, I was maybe somewhat, somewhat in the minority among a lot of my peers, but I really was a true believer in the war on terror. I thought we really were um, bringing some, some semblance, some kind of democracy to the greater Middle East. I mean, I was a real kind of sucker in that respect. Um, but there are also, you know, more embarrassing reasons for why I joined, uh, you know, stuff that happened to me as a child where I felt insecure, where I felt defenseless and where I felt like I needed to become a man. And if I became a man, I could protect myself and I could protect those around me. And especially I could protect whatever woman I ended up being with. Um, so I wanted to explore that a little bit more. And that's really, I think, the driving force of the book that I ended up writing. You, uh, you had talked a, uh, a good bit about your experiences with the Marine Corps and indoctrination and the, the idea to, and I, I love the way that you phrased it. You, you mentioned that you, that leaders or, you know, people who uh, use the military in whatever way that we want us to slowly indulge rather than restrain or check are wanting acts of violence you know they they want people to be violent of a of a certain level but still of course within their controllable un, un, understanding but the the bottom line is is they can't do that there's no there's there's no way that they can know exactly what the trail is what the what the path is for those people for those service members depending on what they go through um but uh, I'd, I'd love you to speak speak about your your experience with indoctrination and uh, especially about uh, depersonalization and dehumanization. Yeah. So um, ever since I got out, I have a uh, left wing great uncle of mine. Um, once he found out I was anti war, coming back from Afghanistan, he hooked me up with uh, a, a counter recruitment group. He had worked with um, the coordinator for that group in the actually in the the, the radical, um, a radical caucus of the New York Teachers Union. Um, so it's an interesting history there. But um, so I didn't end up doing it until a few years after I got got out of the Marine Corps. I think I started in like 2014 or 2015, and I got out of the Marine Corps in 2011. But I started, you know, whenever I had free time on my hands, I would go to New York City. Um, I lived in various different places during this time. Uh, but I would go to New York City and I would speak to um, mostly high school students, sometimes college students, and then a few times even middle school students. Um, but these were schools that were, when it came to the middle schools and high schools, and especially the high schools, they were being targeted by recruiters. Mm. So I would um, speak to them uh, about my experience and, and it was counter recruitment work. I was trying to convince them. Uh, basically not to join up or to just at least think more thoughtfully about the decision, whether they want to join or not. I felt a little uncomfortable. I still feel, I still do it. And I still feel a little uncomfortable, like telling them don't join. Um, not because I don't believe they shouldn't join, but because I realize the social and political economic situations that a lot of these, these young people are in. Sure. Um, so it's more about just kind of like, you know, making sure that they make, they don't make their decision lightly. Um, but in any case, uh, the two themes that I kind of, I, at first I didn't have a script or anything and I was just kind of speaking off the cuff. 
And the two themes I arrived at were de dehumanization, and depersonalization when it comes to military training, and specifically my experience as a Marine. Um, and there's been a lot written about this. So I was basically just summarizing other literature, particularly um, Grossman's book on killing, which you might be familiar with. Um, but he, I mean, the writer of On Kill, that was a huge book when I was in the Marine Corps, and he ended up becoming a pretty reactionary figure himself. Um, I mean, he trains cops, basically. Yeah. Uh, um, and so he's a pretty uh, controversial figure. But there's a lot in that book that is useful about just the training process of entry level training. And in any case, so it is all about both dehumanizing the people that we're going to be fighting and then also uh, depersonalizing the actual fighters themselves. So that's why we don't speak in first person while you're at boot, at boot camp. You know, you speak in third person. It's uh, this recruit requests this, this recruit requests that. Um, and at the same time, you're, you know, you have um, during bayonet training, no one uses bayonets anymore. So you have to ask, why are we doing this bayonet training? Well, it's, it's, a, it's dehumanization training where you're just spending hours on end stabbing, you know, a stack of tires uh, which is shaped like a, like a human being, uh, and you're screaming hot, you know, kill, kill, kill Haji. Um, so, you know, I give this kind of basic information about the training itself to, um, to the students that I speak to, um, but to your larger, and I think even more important question, um, about discipline. So the point I make in the book and the point I've made elsewhere is that I think in the popular imagination, when we think of Marines or when we think of military people in general, we think of them as very disciplined. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. We're very disciplined when it comes to, you know, being able to assemble or disassemble a rifle on, you know, within a certain time period, or we're very disciplined when it comes to um, maneuvering, you know, as a squad or as a, a fire team or a squad or a platoon, uh, we, you know, we can, we're very disciplined when it comes to obeying most of the orders that we're given, particularly in combat. Um, and that's all very true. But I think there's one part of the training, which I think is very fundamental, which is all actually about undisciplined. And that's the moral aspect. I think a lot of military training, in fact, the heart of military training is about undisciplining us morally. And this is a controversial argument that I'm making. A lot of fellow veterans and a lot of um, military brass, political leaders would, would strongly disagree with this and say, oh, no, we're, we, we teach about moral courage all the time, and it's all about making the right decision. Um, and I think there, you know, I saw moral courage when I was in the military, and there are morally courageous people in the military, but I think... Um, if you look at the system as a whole, how it works, our job is to uh, prosecute missions that are at the end of the day, given the fact that we're fighting on behalf of an imperialist aggressive and imperialist aggressive power are fundamentally Im immoral missions. Uh, where we find most, if, if you're at all on the front lines, even if you're not, if, if you're on a watch floor, whether it's a drone watch floor, an intelligence watch floor, really any kind of watch floor, um, to some degree, you are involved in this this policing of these incredibly poor, uh, you know, powerless people. Uh, it's deeply inhumane. Um, and I think anyone, you know, most thoughtful people that experience it, even if they're not willing to admit to themselves at the time, I think throughout their lives, at some point, I mean, they, they do end up, you know, struggling with the immorality of these missions. Um, and, you know, and I think one of the reasons that frontline troops and even the people on the watch floors that are involved in these missions, and I experienced a little bit of both, are uh, are able to obey, obey those orders at the time is because of this training, which, which is a kind of moral undisciplining, uh, which gets you kind of used to these types of missions. Uh, and it's, you know, I compare it to a, you know, the, it's a cliche, but it really is like a, a frog boiling in hot water. It's a very gradual process. And by the time you actually make it 
to a combat zone or you make it to the front line, you're not even fully cognizant of the moral undisciplining that has taken place. Um, and I think that's why I would argue that's why it's so hard for so many veterans um, coming home is, is this slow realization of what they took part in. Uh, sometimes it's not so slow. Sometimes it's, it's quite sudden. Um, and, you know, I wanted, I mean, there's plenty of other writers and plenty of other veterans that had given voice to this, but I wanted to contribute to that as well. I feel like that, that, uh, along, alongside what you're, what you're describing here, that military life, and this is, you know, can, can kind of go for all the branches at, at different times, I suppose that it really, really forces you to narrow your focus in terms of what's important in life and what is, and generally, you know, 99% of your time, if not even more than that is going to back to the, back to the Marine Corps, or in, in, in my case, you know, back, back to the army. And so, you know, when you're always exhausted, when you're always dealing with whatever's happening in front of you, whether that's an operational or training thing, or even a personal thing on the side, whatever that happens to be, that your ability to be able to stop and take a breath and ask those moral questions if they occur to you is very, very few and far between. Yeah. And especially because of the, the and there's so many different examples I can give on this, but in, in terms of the, other areas of the military that we really lack a, a good sense of morality. Um, I know that they've done studies in the army about how much soldiers and officers lie in, in the army in between each other and, and, you know, keeping up appearances, writing certain things on, on, uh, you know, log sheets that are, you know, you, you were five minutes late. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it, you know, and then that ends up becoming that slippery slope. And people become accustomed to it. People become accustomed to that almost entire lack of morality, or at least not useful operational morality, if we want to think about it that way. I, I think it's really important to emphasize, like putting the morality aside. I mean, the the everyday routine of Marines or soldiers, what have you, uh, can be very intense, especially if you're on the front lines or in a combat zone. Uh, so to some degree, the moral, moral on disciplining can be secondary at times to just like this primary fact of like, there's shit you need to get done at any given moment. And yeah. that's where your mind is. Um, I would say, though, that like, even in the training at the initial training itself, I think that's already like being baked into the process, like, because mm -hmm. there's all sorts of metrics you have to meet from the very beginning. And there are certain corners that are being cut from the very beginning that you kind of get used True. to. Like, I mean, when I was at boot camp, uh, actually, I write about this a little bit in the book. But my platoon leader, uh, the um, was the platoon sergeant. Um, I mean, he we won. We had like five competitions throughout uh, the boot camp experience, and we won all. Our platoon won all five, and it was basically through cheating. I mean, he. He, he would send off, like, say it was rifle week, he would send off all the bad shooters to the infirmary for rifle week. If it was, yep. if it was uh, school, if, if it was knowledge week and we were getting tested academically, he would send off the worst students to infirmary that week. And, you know, you see a lot of that. And in this case, it was the actual leader that was doing it. But um, it happens among the actual recruits themselves. I mean, it, OCS, a Marine Officer Candidate School, has been in, you know, multiple cheating scandals have been exposed in, in recent, you know, in the past few decades, uh, usually involving um, land navigation. Uh, it's a particularly difficult test in Officer Candidate School, believe it or not. Um, but you've had like very like major scandals at Officer Candidate School when it comes to cheating, because um, the only way that you know, that you can make it through for a lot of these people is through cheating. Um, so, you know, I think, I think even there, um, it's kind of related to this moral argument I'm making. Um, it's part of the same process. 
but I agree with you. I don't think, again, it's not a self-conscious thing and I don't want to make it seem like, you know, but that most of the Marines or, or soldiers on the front lines are like Nazis. I, in fact, I want to emphasize they're not like, like, I think the whole Nazi, um, kind of figure or icon or this, this idea of like that, like, I think America, a lot of times, and I say this as a Jew, but like the Nazi is a very useful, like bugaboo yeah. <laughs> for like the American mythology, because it's basically anything short of being a Nazi. <laughs> like it, you don't, we don't think a lot about it. Like either you're evil, like a Nazi or you're a saint, you know, right. we don't explore it all the you know the the vast spectrum in between and how the powerful exploit everyone existing between these two extremes and most of us exist within these two extremes and i think a lot of military training is about exploiting people within these extremes within these moral extremes uh for the purposes of achieving whatever mission those with the power and those with the wealth are seeking And there's a, there's a comfort. We want to feel like, uh, you know, like you meant about being earlier talked about being a, a true believer, you know, that, that we, you know, you, you went into it with your best intentions in terms of the best information you had, the knowledge that you had at the time and how all of those things to, uh, came together. Um, you know, that there's, I, I feel like at times, even for any war vets that there's still, a great amount of that second guessing on the part of the anti-war community that like, did you, did you really come over to us or is it, you know, is it, is, is, is this all kind of, you know, bullshit to you? How were you able to have lived that life and then come over here and say whatever it is that you have to say? And I know for me, you know, there was a point where I still did believe in the mission. And then like my second tour, I had one, one thought the whole time. And that was all of my guys are coming home in one piece. That was it. I mean, I did my missions. I did my job. I did everything that was asked of me. But that was my line in the sand about what was happening. Because I knew the mission wasn't successful. And I knew that it was horrifyingly damaging to all of us. Um, I, uh, I, have, I have Crohn's disease. And so mine was, it was developing towards the end of that tour when I was still in Iraq. And so the, um, but we don't, you know, we don't. We don't see it that way. So in, in terms of, you know, soldiers and Marines that we, we see the damage and the destruction that we're able to cause when we go and we do the missions that we have to do. And so I feel like there's a little space in the back of your mind, you know, that we're almost always saying, I'm so thankful it's not me. And at the end of this time, I get to get on a plane and I get to go home. And, and there's a there's a finality for us because it, and that's one thing about it's horrible about being in the military is because everybody's looking to the next thing and they don't put their stake in what's actually happening right there. But of course, we want to go home. We know we're at war. We want to be able to go back. But the the reality on the other side is we just don't even acknowledge it. We don't even look at it, but, but there's this, there's that, I think, you, you know what I mean? You know, okay. Thank God, you know, in terms of the, the Lance corporals and, and corporals in the Marine Corps, thank God I'm not the new guy. Thank God I'm not the new yeah, guy. Of course. New, yeah. And then, and, 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 and that whole hierarchy that goes up into the actual, you know, echelons of the service. But in terms of, you know, thank God I'm on this side of it and dear God, what will happen to me if I cross one of these other lines. I have to keep going in this direction. That was one thing I learned a lot studying about Marine tactics in Fallujah about um, like inertia of movement. You want like your squad, you're sending a squad, your squad into a building and you want them to keep going in the same direction. And so they clear from bottom to top or top to bottom, whichever it is. But I can't remember what the term is in terms of um, the unit keeping its mo motion, we got to move to the next thing, move to the next objective and stuff. And so I just, I read a lot of that studying about Fallujah when we had the other guys on. And talk to me about, about um, people, the military weaponizing people in their drives. Most kids, you know, I mean, we all have very different childhoods, but most kids, when you're very young, you don't, you're not like, and you, you gain the ability to speak and, and someone asks you, what do you want to do when you grow up? 
you know, most kids aren't going to say, I want to pick up a weapon and kill total strangers yeah. thousands of miles away. So I'm interested in the question why so many young men, you know, 15 years later, 10, 15 years later, uh, end up making that decision. And of course, a lot of it is just purely economic. And I, I do want to <laughs> emphasize, you know, I'm, I'm talking about psychological stuff and moral stuff, but I, I, I am a true believer. I mean, to use that term again, but I know I am a big believer that probably the main drive is mostly economic. People need, you know, <laughs> they want to have some kind of job security. And the military, unfortunately, we live in a society where the military is one of the only places you can have real job security and you can get an education and you have, you know, health care. And, you know, there's a joke among, you know, socialists and a lot of folks that like, we have socialism, it's all in the military. You know, we have socialized health care, it's, it's TRICARE and, and all the rest. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. So I, you know, I don't want to de-emphasize the economic. But, you know, I came from a privileged background, like an upper middle class family. So like, why, did, why the fuck did I do it? And you also have a lot of like middle class people that had other options who still choose. And then I would even say like among like poor and working class people, yes, like I think economics is like the driver, the main driver, but there's other, there's also other stuff going on. Sure. You know, life is complicated. Um, and so I'm interested in, the stuff beyond just the merely economic, I think there's a lot of like, I'm very interested in trauma. Like, I think my own under, like my own experience, like I believe that like life is trauma, <laughs> like we're all constantly being traumatized some more, far more than others. But I think life is very difficult. We're always getting hit with one thing or another. And we all react to that in very different ways. And, uh, and often we're, we're not you know, fully aware of how the trauma that we're experiencing is, is affecting our, our, our next move, um, or even our moves like 10, 15 years down the road. Um, so that's something I'm very interested in. Um, and one of the things I was trying to do the book is kind of, I guess, lead by example in that sense, kind of tell my own story and, you know, how my own experience is, again, like I, it's not a sob story in the least, but I, but I felt like I had to at least be honest about my own insecurities and why sure. I felt like I needed to become a Marine. And I met a lot of other, a lot of other people in the Marine Corps, a lot of who, who I became friends with and still are friends with who I think had like related, relatable stories, not, not identical, but it was similar. So it wasn't just about the economic. It was about, again, I think ultimately about becoming a man, feeling secure, feeling safe, feeling like you can protect yourself against sure. all the threats around you. Um, so what empire does, what the military does, but I would argue, you know, my point is that like, I, I am an anti-militarist. I think militarism usually is um, excessive and usually is a problem, but ultimately I'm more of an anti-imperialist than I, than I am an anti, anti-militarist in the sense that I, like, I do believe like, you know, pa like people that have been oppressed and have no choice, but to build a military to protect themselves from the oppressor. Like I sympathize with that. Yeah. And I would like to eventually live in a world without militaries, but until we get there, like, I understand we need, you know, some kind of military. So my major thing is, anti-imperialism uh empire the whole idea that like there are some groups of people that have the right the moral right because it's always morally justified in in the idea you know from the from the perspective and fr from the actual like rhetoric of the imperialists they always try to morally justify their own empires um so this i the it, empire comes down to this idea that we whatever the in-group is has a right to dominate the outgroup. Um, and in order to do that domination of that kind, uh, particularly when you're talking about the United States, which is not just an empire, but the most powerful empire in all of human history, it's, you know, you could, you could argue maybe the British empire um, achieved real global domination, but I think I, I would make an argument that the U S has perfected uh, even, you know, the British legacy as far as global 
domination goes. Um, that kind of domination requires a tremendous amount of exploitation and a tre tremendous amount of policing and a tremendous amount of violence. And it requires a lot of weapons in a conventional sense. It requires a lot of 240 golfs and Mark 19s and hellfires, and all the rest. But it also, most of all, requires human beings. And the military is now trying to move toward a future where it no longer <laughs> requires human beings. It can just basically all be robots. Um, you know, we'll see if they ever achieve that or not. Um, but for the foreseeable future, it's still going to require, even if it's a human being using a robot, you know, you still need the, hu the discretionary uh, agency of the human being itself. So, um, so one of the major problems for empires is how do we turn human beings into weapons? Uh, and my argument is that we use the trauma that these people have already experienced to convince them to become weapons, that, to convince them that it is in their interest and that they will become stronger and have a higher probability of thriving this world or at least surviving by becoming weaponized. Um, so... That's kind of like the whole theme of the entire book, like how empires exploit these drives of insecurity and defenseless, defenseless, defenselessness on the part of normal human beings. A lot of times it's just economic insecurity, like I said, but sometimes it goes beyond that. It's physical insecurity. A lot of young, young men, especially, but even young women feel like they can't protect themselves physically and joining the military. They can get bigger. They can get stronger. People won't mess with them anymore. Um, uh, and also just a kind of like self psychological security. Like maybe if I become a Marine and I fight in war, um, I'll be more confident. Uh, I can come home and do civilian things much more confidently than my peers. Um, you know, and I think there's like, not only do I find that understandable, I think to some degree, it's admirable that young people are willing to take these risks to, to better themselves and to, 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 to strengthen themselves in a very difficult world. Um, but I think ultimately it's a problem, um, because of the, the missions that, that these people are actually being tasked with and the actual violence and exploitation that is, that is resulting from all of this. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One really powerful way to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the Reviews tab. Money is tight these days for everyone, especially in the lingering shadow of COVID. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that, and for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim Shirazi, James Obar, James Higgins, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Rick Coffey, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. And now, let's get back to the podcast. I would, I, I would wonder, um, it, just in terms of your, your, what you were mentioning about, about, you know, the different reasons for, you know, people joining and, or even staying in that, how do you, 
how do you measure the power of somebody with a military family, you know, in terms of what, you know, is it, it, how do you see that weight fitting in with these other, other parameters? So I know that's a great question. And I try to be like, very clear about like this being my own story. And there's a lot oh, that sure, sure. thing and there's a lot that I'm emphasizing that other people wouldn't emphasize because it's not their own story. Like I did not come from a military family, but it makes perfect sense to me that there would be all sorts of pressures. You know, if you do, did you come from a military family? I did. Yeah. 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 So like, and I have a lot of friends of mine that came from military families and like, there's all sorts of pressures there that go beyond what I'm talking about, but also sure. some of them are related in the sense that you want to make your dad proud or your mom proud or, you know, you're like in my case, like I didn't come from a military family, but one of my heroes ever since I was a kid was my grandfather who was a Marine during World War II, fought in the Pacific, got shot in the head at Iwo. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, to some degree, there was a part of me that wanted to make my grandfather proud. You know, he was kind of, he was always the patriarch of the extended family. And uh, I always looked up to him and he, he, he had a confidence about him and, uh, you know, just it, everyone loved him for, you know, rightly so. He was, he was a wonderful human being. Um, but, um, you know, I wanted to be like him. So, you know, I, 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 I did not come from a military family, but I can understand based on my own relationship with my grandfather, I could understand that as well. No, I, I uh, all th uh, three of three of my grandfathers served. Um, my uh, my paternal grandfather, um, he was a Pearl Harbor survivor on the uh, on the USS Tennessee, and then he also he fought in the Aleutians and the Marshall Islands, and uh, he was and then he was in Korea. I remember him telling the the guy in the interview about that because he had a house payment now. He had to go back in the Marine Corps Reserve, so he so he got sent to Korea for his uh, for his house for his house payment. <laughs> um, Good system we got here, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But no, it, it, and this this part's kind of funny too. Is he was asked, you know, the the interviewer asked him. He said, you know, why did Ray? Why did you join? You know, and this was and this was back in you know, I, I what was it thirty nine or forty. It was, you know, uh, uh, maybe, maybe early, early 41. Um, you know, what, what was the thing? What was the driving thing? And he said that I, he really liked their uniforms. He said that, you know, the, 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 those Marine dress blues, man, it, it, it just looked really cool to him. And of course, you know, that was also at a time when having a job that was impossibly hard and might kill you working in a mine, working in a sawmill, all these other very dangerous jobs, absent of the military. That going in and, and being worried about being blown up seems it, it, it seems a little small, in the, at least in <laughs> in in the terms that way. But um, but no, I, I I remember after I had joined, after I had gone to basic, and I came back, and he had some conversations with me that I had never had with him before. You know, more about his experiences and little things. It wasn't you know, it wasn't anything too big, but you could tell that there had been a shift for him. And I thought about that for the longest time, you know, as I said, I, I, I were so glued to those notions of, of connection to things. Uh, lose my train of thought again. Um, sorry, I have memory, memory stuff. Oh, no word. But, but no, but in terms of, in terms of wanting to join, wanting to be connected to him because I joined. And, you know, I had already kind of decided I wanted to be a soldier. I did. I, I it wasn't anything against the Marines. I just, I, it just, what didn't seem interesting to me. I, I don't know what, you know, and, um, but, but he did seem different and it, and it just, it still blows my mind, you know, is that, it, that those invisible barriers that we end up putting up for people, depending on their experiences and depending on how we value those experiences and it just it seems really transactional you know it does it seems really it seems really cheap you know it, it kind of looking looking back on it a bit um you know because those because that's one thing about turning people into weapons is that 
almost everything we do in the service becomes transactional. We become one of those weapons. We have a, a serial number. We have parts that are supposed to be in certain working order, and if not, they get replaced. And if the weapon is, is deadlined, is now, is now unable to work, it gets retired as well. And I, I don't think people quantify that correctly. I don't think they really understand, you know, understand, you know, what, what not like D-Day in terms of the rawness of, of combat or anything like that, but I'm talking about the scale, the number of sons that went through this horrible thing, the, 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 um, and, and how that you, with, with that weapon, with that defaulting weapon that I was talking about, that somewhat like having a suicide in your family or for those unfortunate foes that end up do committing suicide, that they re-traumatize everybody around them too, with their stuff, with their alcoholism, with their domestic violence. And so, you know, this, this, this weapon that, that the service said was defaulted is still firing out into the crowd, so to speak, you know. And what are what are ordinary people supposed to do about it, especially if it's someone that you love very much? You know, you have that grandfather that, you know, I really admire him, but he is a nasty son of a bitch. And I have to I have to, you know, stay within certain boundaries. But the vow, you know, it, it, it um, I'm not sure if I'm getting to a point here or I'm just I'm just no, 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 please keep on. No, no, you're very much getting to the point. Um, but. I wish people could understand that. I wish there, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, creating a, a tattoo or a poster or something about, you know, and superimposing weapons parts with, with a person and understanding this is what you're really doing. This is what your son, daughter, whomever, this is the process that they're going through coming into this society, which expects them to be lethal in a certain way and quiet about it and to keep their as much as possible, their pain, their, their other life trials to themselves. You know, we don't, we don't complain, you know, that, that, that it just, we're, we're, it, we're told to instinctively not complain about things to keep it to ourselves. Please, uh, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? No, I think, I think you stated it, you know, as beautifully and uh, gut wrenchingly as you can. I, I, I think, I mean, I, I use the term recycling of trauma that mm. empire needs to not only weaponize pre-existing trauma, but needs to recycle that trauma for the future generations yep. in order to perpetuate the empire. So the example, I give a lot of examples in the book, but one of them is from a, a student that I connected with very much when I was doing counter recruitment. It was actually a vir virtual class. It was a college class. And um, actually, this one, a friend of mine who was teaching this class just called me up one day. He's like, hey, would you would you want to do a virtual session with my students? And I was like, sure. And he had one um, veteran who I believe was a Marine veteran. And, you know, he basically just ended up telling his whole life story to the entire class and to me. And it was um, and he was crying. And but basically he you know, his grandfather killed himself. His grandfather, I believe his grandfather had fought in World War One or World War, I think World War II. And then his father had fought in Vietnam and then his father killed himself. And he has a, a wife and kids and he's terrified that, you know, he's going to do, he's going to fall in the same tradition as his father and grandfather. And it's all he thinks about. And the only thing that stops him is, he, he has a wife and he has kids. And I mean, it doesn't get any more explicit than that. Um, that's kind of like an ex a, since almost sensational version of it, except it's true. Um, but that's basically how the system works. Um, you know, oftentimes it's not enough to just the trauma that we experience individually in our own lives isn't enough. You need to have the trauma that's intervening in our lives from our father or grandfather or mother or grandmother, whoever, you know, other people in our lives. And that becomes enough to feel like we, you know, that, that, that we need to become weapons too. Um, and yeah, I mean, and I, and I think, you know, one argument that I would, another argument I would make is that the whole, I think that there's a part of patriotism that is admirable. I think the idea of solidarity is admirable. 
Sure, sure. Um, and I think the idea of sacrifice can be admirable. And I even think discipline can be admirable. But I think the way that patriotism works in most countries, and especially an imperialist one like our own, is to basically make it impossible for people like you and I and all those in our lives to speak about this honestly. Because if you start speaking about this stuff honestly, then the patriotic mythology that we have been treated to uh, and that we have learned um, gets called into question. And, you know, so it's not just that the patriotic mythology justifies wars in a very best basic sense. Like we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. That's why we need to go to war to do good. But also these patriotic mythologies end up hurting so many people, especially the people fighting these wars. Mm -hmm. uh, because it makes it impossible for us and for those around us to really have the conversations we need to have and to really face the realities of our lives. I think that that, uh, that really strong myth of redemptive or restorative violence is just so filled in our heads right there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to. No, 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 no. I think that's absolutely true. I, I have yet to read. I don't know if you're referring to, um, there's an amazing trilogy by a historian uh, forgetting his name now, but regenerative violence. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, Matt, Matt Ho. Matt Ho turned me on onto him. I have I have yeah. to read the books, but I, I read some stuff that he wrote online, and yeah, it's brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, stuff. like yeah, basically, like all my favorite writers, like were inspired by that trilogy, and I've yet to actually read the trilogy. But um, yeah, but the term is regenerative violence, and you know, my my understanding is this idea that like like violence itself won't last on its own. Like you need to regenerate it. You need to renew it. Yeah. Uh, and there's all sorts of different ways in which violence gets regenerated and renewed. And it can be through political talking points, you know, Saddam Hussein as weapons of mass destruction or the Taliban is evil and we need to bring democracy to Afghanistan. So it could be like very basic level, but can, it can also be all the stuff we're talking about, which is... Sure you know, more complicated and more difficult for a lot of even people that are on the left, I would say a lot of people that are that are anti war, um, to have these kinds of conversations. Um, but I think they're important conversations to have. And I, I think if there's any hope of, you know, a more peaceful and a more democratic and, 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 and equitable egalitarian future, I think it's going to require a lot of veterans and a lot of people from military families and uh, in, in military towns to basically be, be on the front lines of these efforts. Um, and in order for that to happen, I think we, these conversations need to keep taking place. Now that, um, especially following periods of war that, you know, veterans reentry into society, you know, has driven America into its next eras as time has gone by. And, this is the first this is the first era we've had where you know uh camera and phone technology is to the point where people anywhere can film something and send it somewhere way far away and i i think that there's go going to come a point where um it's just undeniable that certain parts of it are are undeniable it can really really be pushed on if given the right given the right chance the right opportunity what do you mean by, I'm sorry, I didn't like, um, are you talking about like manipulating the, the video technology? No, no. What I, what I mean is, is that, um, things like the, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but the, the Apache shooting, the, the Reuters okay. photographers, you know, that the, that we're going to have these things where even if, even if the person, you know, like the, the you know, the, those pilots were completely cleared of every, everything that happened, right. but that even if we, we do that, we're still able to, to force people to more, just look at the situation. Does it seem okay to you? Does it seem okay that guys in a helicopter from this power are 
killing those dudes. And again, they're journalists. We're not confusing them for anybody else. We know that they had nothing, you know, nothing to do with, with what was going on on the ground. Um, and, and yeah, you're right. You know, that in terms of that, it may, it may come down to, you know, things are going to get easier to manipulate things, you know, changes in, in stuff. But, uh, the, the reason I bring up the, the filming part of it is because you had mentioned in your book, a, uh, an incident from Iraq that, um, I found really powerful and it was, uh, our, uh, last episode or a couple episodes ago, we had on, uh, uh, Ross Caputi. Yep. And we talked about his awesome book, uh, The Sack- Sacking of Fallujah. And the the one way we hadn't gotten to talk about it, but you mentioned in your book was the story of Kevin Seitz and yep. the video that was was taken of uh, Marines sh- essentially shooting wounded prisoners to death. Um, and I kind of want, I wanted to, you know, in kind of, in terms of what we've been talking about in terms of, you know, molding people, you know, molding people into a weapon, how society, uh, you know, uh, points us in those, in, in those directions, um, that as a, as, you know, looking back on it now, what would you have told your men in that situation? You're not, say you're in a, in a different Marine unit, but for whatever reason you have to deal with it, what would you, what would you tell them about that? Was there any way that you could justify that? That's a, I mean, that's a really tough, are you saying like, if, if I am the person I am now, how would I? Uh, kind of, but I, I'm trying to get a, to get a window into, you know, the, 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 you know, would that have been, you know, would that have seemed okay to other officers yourself, you know, in, you know, looking back at the, at the Marine, you were, you know, that the, um, would that would that officer have dealt with that in a different way? Especially, you have to explain it to your subordinates. You know how 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 you would as a leader in terms of the, the yeah. justification. So, so I mean, that's a really good question. I've actually never like thought about it in exactly that way before. But I I think speaking of honest discussions, I I would like to see more honest discussions among officers themselves about the kind of cross pressures involved in their own decision making and their own behavior. And sure, you know, just off the cuff, like I think there's a lot of pressure coming from both. And th- by the way, I don't want this to be read at, at all as like excusing officers oh, no. in these situations. Like that's the farthest thing that I'm doing. But I want to explain like how the system works. So sure, sure. Like either you're like an officer who cares about your own Marines or the, or your own soldiers, whoever is, you know, under you, under your command, or you're not, but either way, you're either concerned about how you look to those above you, or you're concerned about how you look to those below you. Right. And that sounds really bad and really selfish, but like it could even involve like admirable, um, like allegiances. So like you might you know, as an officer, if you, if you're someone who really cares and feels connected to your troops, like you might, your, your first instinct might be, I need to protect my guys or my mm-hmm. girl, you know, but when I was serving, I had all men. So I'm just, just saying, but guys, but in any case, um, you know, you want to protect your guys and there's something to that. That's very admirable. And I still struggle with this question because in my opinion, it's the whole mission that's fucked. And everyone's been weaponized. And to me, like, if anyone's going to be held account- accountable in my mind, like, I want it to be the fuckers that, like, sent us off to war in the first place. That's sure. just where my heart lies. But I also understand that there needs to be accountability, you know, um, beyond that and, and lower down the chain. And I, I struggle with these questions a lot. Um, but I think, you know, so that's difficult. Like if you're an off, you want to protect your guys, you understand they've been through all sorts of shit. You don't know exactly what happened. You know, if you're a good officer and if you feel a connection to your guys, which you should, you want to protect them. So that's your kind of, fr- so that's admirable. On top of that, you want to protect yourself from the perspective of those above you, right? Like you want to make sure that you don't seem like you fucked up, that you didn't you weren't in charge of a, a group of Marines or a group of soldiers that committed war crimes. Um, so 
I think we kind of have to, people like ourselves have to do two things at once. We have to acknowledge these cross pressures and how difficult it is for people in these situations. And at the same time, not excuse it. And also, you know, um, give examples, I guess this is like a third thing, but like, you know, there are some people that have made the right decision. Uh, I mean, the classic example is Hugh Tom is it Hugh Thompson, the helicopter helicopter pilot at Milai at Milai. Yeah. I mean, that's the classic example. He, he had his helicopter land right in between, um, um, they were, were they Marines? I, sorry. I'm like, I'm, I'm having a. I'm forgetting if they were. I want. I want to say they were. Um, uh, no, they were soldiers. I think. Yeah, they were soldiers. So he landed his helicopter in between. He had his gunner point, like, the gun in the direction of the soldiers committing the war crimes, and and he landed his helicopter right in between them and the villagers that were getting basically summarily executed. Um. It was this incredibly heroic act that required just a, a level of initiative and uh, just, you know, bar that term we talked about in the beginning, moral courage uh, that most people simply don't have. And, you know, I think it's very important to highlight these examples because it is possible. You, you can do the right thing in these situations. Um, but it's extremely difficult. And like I said, there's all sorts of cross pressures. Um, and, you know, I'm more interested in creating a world where we no longer have to put people in these situations, uh, as opposed to speaking very confidently about, you know, what I would have done in that situation. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I, I, it's one of the things I've said on the, I think I've, said on the podcast the most is that i i feel like people don't aren't able to connect with the real victims of militarism and imperialism because they don't really understand what happens to soldiers and marines and veterans that it you know that you can read it in a in a history book and it might be exciting to to understand but to have actually lived it and all the different things that come into that because like we're talking about you don't you know you could join the service, whatever branch it is, and go through and not come out with any appreciable trauma to yourself. You know, you come out happy and healthy and go on with the rest of your life. Or you could come out entirely destroyed, if not physically, mentally, if not mentally, psychologically. Um, and we don't, I, I don't think real people reckon with that as much as they should, you know, that, that you, and, and, and kids, you know, we're sending kids to do this, you know, it isn't, 25 or 30 year olds that have, you know, done a few things and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really want to. These are kids that are just graduating from high school. And of course we, we know that that, that is what powers the military is that those years of youth at that age, that's what gets missions done. That's what ends up winning battles is, is that, but we're, you know, just churning, churning people into it. But if we're not really willing to understand that, then of course we're have, we would have difficulty empathizing and understanding with the suffering of the people that were on the other end of the, on the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, I've heard people say this for a while and I, 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 I guess it's true. It's, it's disappointing, but it's true is that, you know, most kids these days have no, I no understanding of the war in Iraq. They just don't, it's, it's history now. I mean, it, 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 you know, most people couldn't tell you that there are still troops there. Most people couldn't tell you that the Iraqi parliament has voted numerous times to remove every U.S. troop that's in Iraq and that we are there in entirely against their wishes. Most people, you know, they just, they won't hear, granted, we, we don't care as Americans. It's just not in our, you know, in our, our media space and our culture. We're just, we're not wired to, but even still it, it, it if we knew, would, would, would people really care? Um, and so I, I think that that's where, I think that's where people need to start. I think they need to, to see where, where, uh, as the, you know, the saying goes, where the metal meets the meat um, and, and understand what that really looks like. And, you know, people, there's this, you know, this, 
the reverence given to veterans, you know, it's like it's too shiny. You can't look directly at it, kind of like looking into the sun. You know, I have to we have to give our obligatory, you know, thank you for your service and, and those kind of things. Um, but but people don't get too close. You know, they, they are they end up assuming that you are someone who is broken and violent. Um, and it's not that it's not possible, but generally speaking, it's not, very, you know, it doesn't happen to people very often. You, it, we just get sacked with the, you know, with the, with the, um, with the label. Um, anyway, um, I think it's probably a good place for us to, uh, to wrap it, wrap it up, Lyle. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your time and coming to chat with me about your book. Um, will you remind people of the the title and when it's going to be released and where they can uh, where they can pick up a copy? Sure. I wish I had a copy with me right now. I I I, I didn't plan as well as, as I should have. But um, the name of the book is "Pain Is Weakness, Leaving the Body: A Marine's Unbecoming." Um, you can get it a lot of places. Actually, um, you can get it on Amazon. Um, unfortunately, the way that this system works with book publishing. It's just as fucked up as every other system where <laughs> there's an incentive for the author, in this case, me to encourage you to buy on Amazon because the Amazon ranking has a major impact on yeah. the overall attention that the book gets. Um, with that said, I am, I would be more than happy if any of you were to patronize your local bookstore or, or use a website like IndieBound or I think Bookshop, Bookshop.com. There's a number of different websites you can use where you can find out the most local bookstore, independent bookstore that has that is stocking the book and you can buy it from them. Um, it, I, I don't think it makes any real difference as far as how much money I get. Uh, whether it's an independent bookstore or Amazon. So if you want to, if you know, support a local bookstore, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, I, 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 you know, I wish I could just kind of hold up the book like right now, like a more experienced author that, you know, they always have the book ready to hold up, but uh, next time I, you'll I, have a stack sure. of them ready. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you again for your time. I will uh, make sure that we link to the book in the show notes. So if anybody is is looking for a copy that they can uh, they can find it real easy. Um, I uh, hope that you'll come back and chat with us again. Absolutely. I know I would love to. I know uh, I know Giovanni was really looking forward to uh, yeah. to chatting you up, and uh, we'll uh, we'll make sure that he uh, he comes in when we have the uh, the next episode. I'm not sure what we'll end up. Uh, talking about but we'll figure, we'll figure that out so but sure thanks lyle appreciate your time i really appreciate it henry thank you i i told you this offline but um you know this is my first uh discussion about my book and and also my first discussion with a fellow veteran about my book so i, I really do appreciate this yeah 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 no i uh it, it, it was it's it's a great it's a great piece of work and it it's uh i think i think everybody should read it i think it it's it, it's it's i think it's it's going to be helpful talking about those intersections that you, we've discussed in the in the interview and and help people understand that and and understand that there's real human beings in there that are you know carrying these weights and and hopefully like you said we can make fewer of them as time as time goes on you know people we, we don't need to people don't need un, unneeded trauma nobody needs it nobody needs to put themselves through that all right henry take care all right. we're on twitter at fortress on a hill and also at facebook.com at fortress on a hill you can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. Come on, you good people, and listen to my song.
I will not.